Okay, back to uh, MOSFETs again. Um, I'm no longer at the airport like the previous lecture, but I'm at home. So if you hear trumpet in the background, that's my oldest son doing his trumpet lessons. So hopefully it's not as noisy and distracting as the airport. So with that, today we're going to look at real MOSFET inverters and capacitance for MOSFETs. Uh, the reason why I say real MOSFET is last time we looked at an ideal MOSFET, meaning that it didn't take into consideration all the real-world factors that can change threshold voltage. So we'll look at that more in detail today. Um, and again, not in this first part, in the second part of this lecture, though, we will actually get to the point where you can understand how you make an inverter out of MOSFETs. And it'll be pretty interesting to see the roles of the various PN junctions at play for that device. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time over these slides. You've seen them from last, from last lecture. Um, you should be able to answer questions like these before you start today. If not, it'll be very confusing. And you should be able to readily understand the, the various states of operation, anywhere from accumulation, which puts extra holes under the, uh, under the uh, gate for an NMOS device, flat band, depletion and weak inversion. This is when you're starting to to bias it in the right way to get a channel, but you don't get a channel, you only get depletion charge, and then getting inversion where electrons start to appear in the channel, and they can, then you can get source to drain con current. Okay, so let's start with our where we left off last time with this threshold voltage equation. We said that for the ideal case, threshold voltage is equal to two terms that contribute to it in the ideal case first term we have here is that we have to deplete holes, right? And so as we bend these bands, holes are depleted this way. That leaves behind those negatively charged boron atoms. That's a charge we have to pay for. A charge dropped across a capacitance is a voltage, so we have to pay for that voltage to turn the MOSFET on. And it made sense because the negatively charged boron atoms, negative charge, right? So negative charge Negative times a negative makes this a net positive, adds to our threshold voltage, which makes sense because for PMOS devices, we must have positive voltage and positive charge on this side to create the negatively charged channel on the other side of the capacitor. The second thing we had to do is we had to basically shift the bands at the interface such that the interface now looks as just N-type as it was previously P-type. So if we have this much offset here, meaning below the intrinsic level, it's this much p-type at the interface, we're going to have to have this dip below this line by, this, by that amount or more. And how you measure that, if this was phi sub f, then we need two phi sub f. We have to go one, two to shift it to n-type material. So two phi sub f, and that's easy to calculate as well. Okay? So that's where we left off. Now, first thing we're going to look at for a real MOSFET in real world parameters is that we're not going to have the case where the metal and the semiconductor have the same work functions. Before we assumed they were equal and so that gave me Fermi levels lining up and I'm at flat band I had no bending of the bands whatsoever. Okay. For a real MOSFET we don't use a metal on the gate at all. We actually in industry they typically use a heavily doped polysilicon gate. Polysilicon means polycrystalline silicon. A perfect silicon wafer is single crystal, meaning there's the same crystal orientation all the way across the wafer. Polysilicon means it's highly crystalline but only in local domains. But it has most of the same properties of, of a single crystal substrate. And so they could deposit this down and it works quite well for MOSFETs. And what's going to happen here is that if you think about this, okay, um, an easy way to, to figure out what's going to happen here is when I had a PN junction, right, if we had a PN junction where here's the P side and here's the N side, we know when we join the P and the N type material together, our band's bent like this, right? That's my best job to draw that, right? Well, look what I have here. Now on this side, I've got the P side. On this side, I've got the N side, right? And so the N side is going to be lower. And when you go from N to P, you have to go uphill, right? Same thing here. This is the N plus polysilicon. We can treat it like a metal because it's so heavily doped. And you have, you have that same band bending now from N to P. You can see here where it brought this side down. 
The other way we do this, other way we do this is basically looking at the difference between the metal work function and the semiconductor work function. In this case, the metal work function will be less, right? So remember, our work function was measured out to the vacuum level, right? So for the n-type side, there's my, well, I'm sorry, that's after it's joined. But for the n-type side, if I looked at my work functions for two types of materials, okay, where if this is the, this is the vacuum level up here, okay, if I have n-type semiconductor and then I have p-type semiconductor, you can see that the distance between the vacuum level and the n-type semiconductor for work function is less than the distance for p-type semiconductor and the vacuum level. So phi sub m is less than phi sub s because the metal in this case is heavily doped n plus silicon. And as you line these things up, that means, of course, this one effectively has to shift up, this has to shift down. And so this goes up, this goes down, and then you get the band bending you see here. Okay? All the band bending occurs on the oxide and the lightly doped side. So this is so heavily doped that you assume there's no band bending here. Again, we treat it like a metal, essentially. The other thing that's interesting to know here is that as soon as you see this happen here, you know that when I get the band bending, holes drift out here, right? And so that means I've got some net negative charge here, right? Well, if I have a net negative charge to those boron atoms that are left behind, and this is a capacitor, I have to have a positive charge over here. If I have positive charge and negative charge, I have voltage across here in E-field. That is why my bands are bent, because I actually have a voltage drop here induced for that. And that's not, shouldn't be that striking. If I had a PN junction, I had the same thing, right? When you made a PN junction, you got a contact potential. This is just like a contact potential as well, where the Fermi levels line up and they give you that amount of, amount of contact potential. So, how are we going to add this into our model, okay? So here's our real MOSFET device with phi sub m less than phi sub s. So for this example, does this raise or lower our threshold voltage? And you can do this just by looking at the equation we get or the bands. So first we'll look at the equation. Here's the real case. I'm just going to put phi sub m s in there because these are potentials, right? This is energy. Q times potential gives me energy. Just phi is potential, so I can put potential right into my threshold voltage equation because the units for potential are also voltage. So you could look at the equation here and say, well, phi sub m is less than phi sub s. We already said that on the previous slide. If that's the case, then this is negative. If I put this in here as a negative, that means this will actually reduce the amount of voltage it takes to turn my MOSFET on. So can you see that in the diagram as well? Well, look at our starting position here. When the Fermi level is lined up, you could see that it's helping me start to bend the bands down. And we said that when we turned a MOSFET on, if it's an N-channel device, we had to bend these bands down here to basically get the surface potential to get two phi sub f, right? Well, you can clearly see that when these line up, it gives you a little bit of a head start. So this lowers our threshold voltage, which again should make sense given that this is a negative sign here in the threshold voltage equation. And so I have my ideal case, which is depletion and two phi sub f. And now for the real case, I'm adding in, in addition to those two, I'm adding in the, the uh, phi sub ms, the difference in Look at this in a little bit more detail and figure out how this might change with doping level in the substrate. So this is a plot of phi sub ms, okay, versus doping level in the substrate. Let's look at this case first. This is N plus polysilicon, that's the gate, so that's out here, that's my gate material, on top of P-type silicon channel, like I have here, P-type silicon. So this is right here, this is NMOS, okay, meaning I want to change the P-type substrate into an n-type channel. Now, look what happens here. As I increase my doping level here, okay, and in this, for n if it's p-type silicon, it'll be n sub a, so I'm increasing n sub a. We know that the Fermi level shifts closer to the valence band, right? If this shifts down, then that means this distance here, phi sub s, increases. Well, if phi sub s increases, 
And phi sub m, m, s, phi sub m s is phi sub m minus phi s, and this is getting bigger and bigger, this becomes more negative. Look at that. Phi sub m s gets more negative as I increase doping level. That should make sense. Now look at the case instead of a NMOS device, but we'll look at a PMOS device. So this curve is for PMOS, N-type silicon substrate, in which I want to make a P-type channel, hence I call it PMOS. And you can see that phi sub ms is decreasing. That should make sense. I mean, it's not decreasing and become more negative, but it's getting closer to zero. Why is that? Well, if I dope something more and more N-type, the Fermi level shifts up. If it shifts up, then this distance here decreases. And so then I have something, this minus a number which is decreasing, which makes this less negative. And look at the trend here. This is going all the way eventually to zero. That should make sense because think about this. If I have N plus very heavily doped silicon for my gate metal, and then I start making this side heavily doped N type silicon, then if the materials are become the same, where they're both heavily doped, the Fermi level should line up, and I should have no phi sub MS, right? Because their, their work functions will be the same. You can see this thing trends to zero. It also shows you just how heavily doped the gate is. Here's 10 to the 18th. You can see this thing won't get to zero until I get way out to, you know, almost 10 to the 19th or so in terms of concentration. So this is extremely heavily doped, and you can see that trend on this plot as well. Okay. So, are we done yet? Not yet. There's a couple things more we need to add. So, what we've talked about so far is if for your real case of, of threshold voltage thus far, you need to basically get inversion, 2 phi sub f, you need to deplete holes, and we said you need to take into consideration the metal semiconductor work function difference phi sub ms. One of the other things we need to look at is something called interface charge, q sub i. So when you look at the oxide, there's actually a lot of interesting charges that are at play there. And we know that any time we have charges near a dielectric, we could have potentials via Q equals CV, right? And so if you look at this here, one of the things that often dominates is this interface charge. Right here at the interface, you see these little charge signs here. We'll talk a little bit more what this is, but typically this can be positive which will attract the bands down. So if you look at the interface charge here, I'm sorry, it's actually this stuff right here, these positive charges here. This is a positive charge. Remember, positive charge and positive voltage takes our bands and shifts them down. So how would we add this to our threshold voltage equation? Well, you can see we've done it right here. We've added this new term, interface charge divided by capacitance, which turns it into voltage we can see it's a net subtracted, which makes sense because if I put positive charge here, that pulls my bands down just like positive voltage would, and that should subtract from my threshold voltage because it's, again, again giving me a head start as it's pulling the bands down here. Let's take another deeper look at this. So looking at this interface charge in more detail, here's how it's made up. So here's my gate, here's my gate, here's my oxide, here's the oxide, Here's the semiconductor, here's the semiconductor, okay? Now, you'll notice my oxide, I've broken up into two regions here. I'll get to that in a second, okay? Some of the charges you get in here, you can see as follows, are the sodium, which are mobile ionic charge. So if you have oxide and you have any sodium near it as you're making it, the sodium gets in there and creates positive charges. And so this is a big issue for semiconductor manufacturing. You don't want any salt anywhere near your fabrication facility. Otherwise, it will throw all your threshold voltages off. The other charges you'll see in here are these oxide trap charges. These are mainly just for defects and other things, but they tend to, their net charge can uh, cancel out. So you don't have to worry about those. You have an interface charge down here, which could be plus, minus, plus, minus. It kind of cancels out, but, the, you know, it's going to come back later. We're going to see that this causes some problems for us later. But it doesn't really dominate this threshold voltage shift. What does dominate is this oxide fish, fixed charge. So remember, how do we make our, our dielectric? Well, how we made our dielectric is we started with perfect silicon. Then we expose it to oxygen or moisture out here, which oxidizes it and basically goes deeper and deeper and deeper into the silicon, turning into oxide. Well, 
if you look here at the interface, the oxide that has to diffuse through silicon dioxide to keep growing deeper and deeper into the silicon, right? To keep basically making a thicker layer of, a, of rust, basically. Well, it has difficulty doing so right near the interface when it gets to here. And so right near the interface, you might not have all the oxygen you need to make perfect stoichiometric silicon dioxide where you've got two oxygens for every silicon. If you're missing oxygens, because you haven't got as many as you need down here to fully react this layer, then oxygen is electronegative, you end up with a net positive charge. And so this net positive charge shows up near the interface and will pull our bands down and reduce our threshold voltage. Again, we put this in the equation with a negative sign in front, this net positive charge pulls it down, ends up giving me a negative voltage here, pulling my threshold voltage down. Don't get confused. You remember, QD max here also has a negative in front, but QD is a negative charge. It's those boron atoms. So this one increases our threshold voltage. Last thing I'll note here, uh, before we leave this slide, is this sodium charge. Is, there's a, some interesting history here. They used to be up in Dayton, uh, National Cash Register, NCR, had a semiconductor fabrication facility. And they were making semiconductors up, up there and chips because they made cash registers. And one of the first applications for logic devices was to make fast and um, powerful cash registers in, for grocery stores and things like that. Well, to make a long story short, in the winter, they would pay the city of Dayton, they would actually, not, I don't know if they pay them or not, but they did, had the city of Dayton not salt the roads within several city blocks of their manufacturing facility, facility, such that no one would track any sodium chloride into the fabrication facility. So they would clear the streets themselves without salt because they couldn't have any salt near their facility because if salt came into the facility, it threw all the threshold voltages off for their, uh, for their chips. So at this point, now we have the full story. So let's review. We started with the ideal case from last lecture. We had depletion of holes out front and getting strong inversion to phi sub f. So make it just as n-type as it was previously p-type in the substrate. What we've added here today are the work functions out front here, you can see, and interface charge which then add with the real case one. So the ideal case is a combination of these non-ideal factors and the ideal factors. So at this point, you can take a break and, and, and do a quick review before you do so. Looking over at what we've learned, what factors are needed for the ideal threshold voltage, and do they increase or decrease my threshold voltage? Meaning, are they a price I have to pay, or do they help me? Second question, what factors are needed for the real threshold voltage, and do they increase or decrease my threshold voltage, meaning are they a price I have to pay, or do they help me lower threshold voltage? Of these factors for the real threshold voltage, which ones will change with doping level? So if you look at the equation, for the real fact, for the whole equation here, of these four terms, which ones will change as I change doping level down in the p-type substrate? And the hint is that there are three of them that will change, and one will not. Last one, phi sub ms, okay, this term out front. For an N plus polysilicon gate and an N plus substrate underneath, where you get the doping levels to be almost equal between the gate and the substrate, what will phi sub ms be approximately? This should be really easy if you remember the argument we had from the previous, previous, uh, previous slide on it.